The Black Woman of the South, Her Neglects and Her Needs Address before the Freedmen's Aid Society, Methodist Episcopal Church, Ocean Grove, New Jersey, August fifteenth, 1883, by Alexander Crummel, Daughter of Divinity. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times The Black Woman of the South, Her Neglects and Her Needs by Alexander Crummel Alexander Crummel, Doctor of Divinity, an eminent Negro Episcopal clergyman, a graduate of Oxford University, England, professor in a Liberian college, rector of St. Luke's in Washington, and founder of the Negro Academy. It is an age clamorous everywhere for the dignities, the grand prerogatives, and the glory of woman. There is not a country in Europe where she has not risen somewhat above the degradation of centuries, and pleaded successfully for a new position and a higher vocation. As the result of this new reformation, we see her, in our day, seated in the lecture-rooms of ancient universities, rivaling her brothers in the fields of literature, the grand creators of ethereal art, the participants in noble civil franchises, the moving spirit in grand reformations, and the guide, agent, or assistant in all the noblest movements for the civilization and regeneration of man. In these several lines of progress, the American woman has run on in advance of her sisters in every other quarter of the globe. The advantage she has received, the rights and prerogatives she has secured for herself, are unequaled by any other class of women in the world. It will not be thought amiss, then, that I come here today to present to your consideration the one grand exception to this general superiority of women, viz the black woman of the south the rural or plantation population of the south was made up almost entirely of people of pure negro blood and this brings out also the other disastrous fact namely that this large black population has been living from the time of their introduction into america a period of more than two hundred years in a state of unlettered rudeness the negro all this time has been an intellectual starveling. This has been more especially the condition of the black woman of the South. Now and then a black man has risen above the debased condition of his people. Various causes would contribute to the advantage of the men. The relation of servants to superior masters. Attendance at courts with them. Their presence at political meetings listening to table talk behind their chairs, traveling as valets, the privilege of books and reading in great houses, and with indulgent masters, all these serve to lift up a black man here and there to something like superiority, but no such fortune fell to the lot of the plantation woman. The black woman of the South was left perpetually in a state of hereditary darkness and rudeness. In her girlhood, all the delicate tenderness of her sex was rudely outraged. In the field, in the rude cabin, in the press-room, in the factory, she was thrown into the companionship of coarse and ignorant men. No chance was given for her delicate reserve or tender modesty. From her girlhood she was the doomed victim of the grossest passions. All the virtues of her sex were utterly ignored. If the instinct of chastity asserted itself, then she had to fight like a tigress for the ownership and possession of her own person, and oft-times had to suffer pains and lacerations for her virtuous self-assertion. When she reached maturity, all the tender instincts of her womanhood were ruthlessly violated. At the age of marriage, always prematurely anticipated under slavery, she was mated as the stock of the plantation were mated, not to be the companion of a loved and chosen husband, but to be the breeder of human cattle for the field or the auction block. With that mate she went out, morning after morning to toil, as a common field hand. As it was his, 
so likewise was it her lot to wield the heavy hoe or to follow the plough or to gather in the crops she was a hewer of wood and a drawer of water she was a common field hand she had to keep her place in the gang from morn till eve under the burden of a heavy task or under the stimulus or the fear of a cruel lash she was a picker of cotton she labored at the sugar mill and in the tobacco factory when through weariness or sickness she has fallen behind her allotted task there came as punishment the fearful stripes upon her shrinking lacerated flesh her home life was of the most degrading nature she lived in the rudest huts and partook of the coarsest food and dressed in the scantiest garb and slept in multitudinous cabins upon the hardest boards thus she continued a beast of burden down to the period of those maternal anxieties which in ordinary civilized life give repose quiet and care to expectant mothers but under the slave system few such relaxations were allowed and so it came to pass that little children were ushered into this world under conditions which many cattle raisers would not suffer for their flocks or herds thus she became the mother of children but even then there was for her no suretyship of motherhood or training or control her own offspring were not her own she and husband and children were all the property of others all these sacred ties were constantly snapped and cruelly sundered this year she had one husband and next year through some auction sale she might be separated from him and mated to another there was no sanctity of family no binding tie of marriage none of the fine felicities and the endearing affections of home none of these things was the lot of southern black women instead thereof a gross barbarism which tended to blunt the tender sensibilities to obliterate feminine delicacy and womanly shame came down as her heritage from generation to generation and it seems a miracle of providence and grace that notwithstanding these terrible circumstances so much struggling virtue lingered amid these rude cabins that so much womanly worth and sweetness abided in their bosoms as slaveholders themselves have borne witness to but some of you will ask why bring up these sad memories of the past why distress us with these dead and departed cruelties alas my friend these are not dead things remember that the evil that men do lives after them the evil of gross and monstrous abominations the evil of great organic institutions crop out long after the departure of the institutions themselves if you go to europe you will find not only the roots but likewise many of the deadly fruits of the old feudal system still surviving in several of its old states and kingdoms so too with slavery the eighteen years of freedom have not obliterated all its deadly marks from either the souls or bodies of the black woman the conditions of life indeed have been modified since emancipation but it still maintains that the black woman is the pariah woman of this land we have indeed degraded women immigrants from foreign lands in their own countries some of them were so low in the social scale that they were yoked with the cattle to plough the fields they were rude unlettered coarse and benighted but when they reach this land there comes an end of their degraded condition they touch our country and their shackles fall as soon as they become grafted into the stock of american life they partake at once of all its large gifts and its noble resources not so with the black woman of the south freed legally she has been but the act of emancipation had no talismanic influence to reach to and alter and transform her degrading social life when that proclamation was issued she might have heard the whispered words in her every hut open sesame but so far as her humble domicile and her degraded person were concerned there was no invisible but gracious genie who on the instant could 
transmute the rudeness of her hut into instant elegance, and change the crude surroundings of her home into neatness, taste, and beauty. The truth is, Emancipation Day found her a prostrate and degraded being, and, although it has brought numerous advantages to her sons, it has produced but the simplest changes in her social and domestic condition. She is still the crude, rude, ignorant mother. Remote from cities, the dweller still in the old plantation hut, neighboring to the sulky, disaffected master class, who still think her freedom was a personal robbery of themselves, none of the fair humanities have visited her humble home. The light of knowledge has not fallen upon her eyes. The fine domesticities which give the charm to family life, and which by the refinement and delicacy of womanhood preserve the civilization of nations, have not come to her. She still has the rude, coarse labor of men. With her rude husband she still shares the hard service of a field hand. Her house, which shelters, perhaps, some six or eight children, embraces but two rooms. Her furniture is of the rudest kind. The clothing of the household is scant and of the coarsest material, has oft times the garniture of rags, and for herself and offspring is marked, not seldom, by the absence of both hats and shoes. She has rarely been taught to sew, and the field labor of slavery times has kept her ignorant of the habitudes of neatness and the requirements of order. Indeed, coarse food, coarse clothes, coarse living, coarse manners, coarse companions, coarse surroundings, coarse neighbors, both black and white, yea, everything, coarse down to the coarse, ignorant, senseless religion, which excites her sensibilities and starts her passions, go to make up the life of the masses of black women in the hamlets and villages of the rural South. This is the state of black womanhood. Take the girlhood of this same region, and it presents the same aspect, save that in large districts the white man has not forgotten the olden times of slavery, and with, indeed, the deepest sentimental abhorrence of amalgamation, still thinks that the black girl is to be perpetually the victim of his lust. In the larger towns and in cities our girls in common schools and academies are receiving superior culture. Of the 15,000 colored school teachers in the South, more than half are colored young women, educated since emancipation. But even these girls, as well as their more ignorant sisters in rude huts, are followed and tempted and insulted by the ruffianly element of southern society, who think that black men have no rights which white men should regard, and black women no virtue which white men should respect. And now look at the vastness of this degradation. If I had been speaking of the population of a city, or a town, or even a village, this tale would be a sad and melancholy one. But I have brought before you the conditions of millions of women. According to the census of 1880, there were in the southern states 3,327,678 females of all ages of the African race. Of these there were 674,365 girls between 12 and 20, 1,522,696 between 20 and 80. These figures, remarks an observing friend of mine, are startling. And when you think that the masses of these women live in the rural districts, that they grow up in rudeness and ignorance, that their former masters are using few means to break up their hereditary degradation, you can easily take in the pitiful condition of this population, and forecast the inevitable future to multitudes of females, unless a mighty special effort is made for the improvement of the black womanhood of the South. I know the practical nature of the American mind. I know how the question of values intrudes itself even into the domain of philanthropy. And hence, I shall not be astonished if the query suggests itself, 
whether special interest in the black woman will bring any special advantage to the american nation let me dwell for a few moments upon this phase of the subject possibly the view i am about suggesting has never before been presented to the american mind but negro as i am i shall make no apology for venturing the claim that the negress is one of the most interesting of all the classes of women on the globe i am speaking of her not as a perverted and degraded creature but in her natural state with her native instincts and peculiarities let me repeat just here the words of a wise observing tender-hearted philanthropist whose name and worth and words have attained celebrity it is fully forty years ago since the celebrated dr channing said we are holding in bondage one of the best races of the human family the negro is among the mildest gentlest of men he is singularly susceptible of improvement from abroad his nature is affectionate easily touched and hence he is more open to religious improvement than the white man the african carries with him much more than we the genius of a meek long-suffering loving virtue i should feel ashamed to allow these words to fall from my lips if it were not necessary to the lustration of the character of my black sisters of the south i do not stand here to-day to plead for the black man he is a man and if he is weak he must go the wall he is a man he must fight his own way and if he is strong in mind and body he can take care of himself but for the mothers sisters and daughters of my race i have a right to speak and when i think of their sad condition down south think too that since the day of emancipation hardly any one has lifted up a voice in their behalf i feel it a duty and a privilege to set forth their praises and to extol their excellencies for humble and benighted as she is the black woman of the south is one of the queens of womanhood if there is any other woman on this earth who in native aboriginal qualities is her superior i know not where she is to be found for i do say that in tenderness of feeling in genuine native modesty in large disinterestedness in sweetness of disposition and deep humility in unselfish devotedness and in warm motherly assiduities the negro woman is unsurpassed by any other woman on this earth the testimony to this effect is almost universal our enemies themselves being witnesses you know how widely and how continuously for generations the negro has been traduced ridiculed derided some of you may remember the journals and the hostile criticisms of coleridge and trollope and burton west indian and african travellers very many of you may remember the philosophical disquisitions of the ethnological school of eighteen forty seven the contemptuous dissertations of hunt and glidden but it is worthy of notice in all these cases that the sneer the contempt the bitter gibe have been invariably levelled against the black man never against the black woman on the contrary she has almost everywhere been extolled and eulogized the black man was called a stupid thick-lipped flat-nosed long-heeled empty-headed animal the link between the baboon and the human being only fit to be a slave but everywhere even in the domains of slavery how tenderly has the negress been spoken of she has been the nurse of childhood to her all the cares and heart griefs of youth have been entrusted thousands and tens of thousands in the west indies and in our southern states have risen up and told the tale of her tenderness of her gentleness patience and affection no other woman in the world has ever had such tributes to a high moral nature sweet gentle love and unchanged devotedness and by the memory of my own mother and dearest sisters i can declare it to be true here the tribute of Michelet. The negress of all others is the most loving, the most generating, and this not only because of her youthful blood, but we must also admit for the richness of her heart. 
she is loved among the loving good among the good ask the travellers whom she has so often saved goodness is creative it is fruitfulness it is the very benediction of a holy act the fact that woman is so fruitful i attribute to her treasures of tenderness to that ocean of goodness which permeates her heart africa is a woman her races are feminine in many of the black tribes of central africa the women rule and they are as intelligent as they are amiable and kind the reference in michelet to the generosity of the african woman to travellers brings to mind the incident in mungo park's travels where the african women fed nourished and saved him the men had driven him away they would not even allow him to feed with the cattle and so faint weary and despairing he went to a remote hut and lay down on the earth to die one woman touched with compassion came to him brought him food and milk and at once he revived then he tells us of the solace and the assiduities of these gentle creatures for his comfort i give you his own words the rites of hospitality thus performed toward a stranger in distress my worthy benefactress pointing to the mat and telling me that i might sleep there without apprehension called to the female part of her family which had stood gazing on me all the while in fixed astonishment to resume the task of spinning cotton in which they continued to employ themselves a great part of the night they lightened their labours by songs one of which was composed extempore for i was myself the subject of it it was sung by one of the young women the rest joining in a sort of chime the air was sweet and plaintive and the words literally translated were these the winds roared and the rains fell the poor white man faint and weary came and sat under our tree he has no mother to bring him milk no wife to grind his corn let us pity the white man no mother has he etc perhaps i may be pardoned the intrusion just here on my own personal experience during a residence of nigh twenty years in west africa i saw the beauty and felt the charm of the native female character i saw the native woman in her heathen state and was delighted to see in numerous tribes that extraordinary sweetness gentleness docility modesty and especially those maternal solicitudes which make every african boy both gallant and defender of his mother i saw her in her civilized state in sierra leone saw precisely the same characteristics but heightened dignified refined and sanctified by the training of the schools the refinements of civilization and the graces of christian sentiment and feeling of all the memories of foreign travel there are none more delightful than those of the families and the female friends of freetown a french traveller speaks with great admiration of the black ladies of haiti in the towns he says i met all the charms of civilized life the graces of the ladies of port-au-prince will never be effaced from my recollections it was without doubt the instant discernment of these fine and tender qualities which prompted the touching sonnet of wordsworth written in eighteen o two on the occasion of the cruel exile of negroes from france by the french government driven from the soil of france a female came from calais with us brilliant and array a negro woman like a lady gay yet downcast as a woman fearing blame meek destitute as seemed of hope or aim she sat from notice turning not away but on all proffered intercourse did lay a weight of languid speech or at the same was silent motionless in eyes and face meanwhile those eyes retained their tropic fire which burning independent of the mind joined with the lustre of her rich attire to mock the outcast o ye heavens be kind and feel thou earth for this afflicted race but i must remember that i am to speak not only of the neglects of the black woman but also of her needs and the consideration of her needs suggests the remedy which should be used for the uplifting of this woman from a state of brutality and degradation 
Ladies and gentlemen, since the day of emancipation, millions of dollars have been given by the generous Christian people of the North for the intellectual training of the black race in this land. Colleges and universities have been built in the South, and hundreds of youth have been gathered within their walls. The work of your own church in this regard has been magnificent and unrivaled, and the results which have been attained have been grand and elevating to the entire Negro race in America. The compliment to all this generous and ennobling effort is the elevation of the black woman. Up to this day and time, your noble philanthropy has touched, for the most part, the male population of the South, given them superiority, and stimulated them to higher aspirations. But a true civilization can only then be attained when the life of woman is reached, her whole being permeated by noble ideas, her fine taste enriched by culture, her tendencies to the beautiful gratified and developed, her singular and delicate nature lifted up to its full capacity. And then, when all these qualities are fully matured, cultivated, and sanctified, all their sacred influences shall circle around ten thousand firesides, and the cabins of the humblest freedmen shall become the homes of Christian refinement and of domestic elegance, through the influence and the charm of the uplifted and cultivated black woman of the South. End of The Black Woman of the South her neglects and needs by alexander crummell